Hello everybody and welcome to another C++ tutorial for beginners. In this video, I'm going to be covering functions. Now functions are extremely important. They're the first time we're really going to see now why we had to learn a ton of the stuff that we did. Well, anyways, let's dive into the video and discuss functions. So you may remember that at the very beginning of this series, I mentioned that this right here, int main is a function. And I said this is a special function, works a little bit differently than other functions that we're going to see, but this is indeed a function. And now I'm going to show you how we can make our own functions. But first, let's quickly describe kind of what a function is and what the point of it is. So a function is really just a block of code. And this is something that is reusable and functions can take in what's known as parameters or arguments. So you can pass some information to a function it can do something with that and it can return to you a value. However, a function does not need to just take information and return stuff. It can also just do something on its own. For example, you may have a function that closes the program. You may have a function that asks the user for some input. A function does not always need to say, take information and return something. It can also just do something on its own. However, a lot of the functions that we're going to see in that are used take in some information and return to us some other information. They do some kind of operation with the information past them, and then they return it to us. Now, a really kind of naive, simple example is a function that maybe adds two numbers. You pass in the number x, y, it then adds x and y and returns to you the addition of those two numbers. Now, this is not an extremely useful function, but that's an example of something a function may do. And the point of functions is to make a reusable block of code that does something specific. It does one thing very well that, again, can be used in different parts of the program. So let's say you have a very complicated physics equation. Well, you probably don't want to write that out a hundred times every single time you need to perform or evaluate that expression. And so what you would do is write a function that can take in all of the inputs to that expression or to that equation. And then what it can do is solve that for you and return to you the answer. And so that is kind of the idea of the functions. They separate pieces of logic in our code and they allow us to have reusable blocks of code. And so I'm just going to start by creating a function and showing you kind of how they work. So I'm going to say int. Now, whenever you define a function, the first thing you must do is define the return type of this function. So if your function is going to return a value to the caller of this function, so I'll make sense in a moment, you must define what type that value will be. So in this case, I'm making a very simple function. I'm going to say int. This means this function will return an integer value from it. And then I'm going to say add. And what this function is going to take is two values. It's going to take an int, which is known as x, and it's going to take an int, which is known as y. So we're using this kind of naive example I described. So what I've done is I've declared my function. It returns an int. It takes in two integers. These things here are what is known as the parameters of a function. These are the things that must be passed to the function for it to run. And then I do my curly braces, and now I start the body of the function. So what's inside of these curly braces is known as the body of the function. And this is where I can do whatever I want. And then at the end, I can return a value if my function needs to return a value. And that value must be the type stated that it will return. So in this case, I'm going to say return x plus y. What this means is that this function will take x value, take a y value, it will add these two values together, and it will return it to whatever call. So now if I go in my main function and I say int result equals add to three, and then I say C out and I see out my result. And we'll just do an end L here in case we do some other stuff after. So oops, and L. And yeah, and then we just run this, you're going to see that we get five. So I know I went kind of fast here. I'll uh, kind of go through all of this. So this is what's known as a function call. And the way you call a function is you put the name of the function, you put an open parenthesis, you put a closing closing parenthesis, sorry, and then inside of the parentheses, you put the arguments to the function. So this is what is known as the arguments. So this argument here is two, and it corresponds with the parameter x. This argument is three. It corresponds with the parameter y. So I passed in x, which is two. I passed in y, which was three. I added these two values together. And then what happened is when I called this function, it executed all of this code. It waited until the return statement, and then it returned some value. So the value that was returned kind of replaces the call to this function. You can imagine that what kind of happens is we go through our program. We read the fact that add exists. We read the fact that main exists. We run the main function. 
we create this variable result. We say it's equal to add two, three. That means we then go to add. We pass in two for X. We pass in three for Y. We add these values, which is five. We return it. We come here and we say, well, you called this function. It returned a value. So now this is equal to five. Result is equal to the return value of that function. And then we printed out five. So hopefully that gave you kind of the run through of how a function operates. This is the most basic example I can give you as a function. Now, of course, functions do not need to take in values. I can have a function here. It says int say get number. And actually we could do. Yeah, we'll just get get number. That's fine. And then what this can do is just return some number six. And now what I can do is say result is equal to get number. I do need to call this function still, even though it doesn't take in any values. When I add these parentheses, what this is saying is call this function, tell this function to run. And now if I look at my result, I get six. I didn't need to pass any values, but I still could return a value. In this case, I returned six. Now let's see what happens if I decide to return five after I return six. Well, what happens is nothing. This five does nothing. As soon as a return statement is hit in a function, that function is immediately done. It executes, it finishes, and it goes back to whatever called it. Now, the great thing about functions, though, is that we can use them many, many times. And so that is why you would create a function. So what I'm going to do now is see out not result, but I'm going to see out get number, right? I'm just reusing this function. And then I'm going to see out get number a bunch of times. And now you're going to see that this works. We just keep reusing this function multiple times. Now, get number is not the best example uh, of why we would reuse a function, but add kind of gives us a decent example. I say add, you know, two, five. And then I, I copy this and I print it a few times and I change, you know, four to seven. Now I can go to six. Then go to nine. This can be negative two. This can be negative eight. Okay, let's get rid of that and let's run this. Now we get all of our results, right? We can reuse the function many times. Now, of course, in these kind of simple, naive examples, it's like, well, why would we do that? Why wouldn't we just add these values? Well, because you can have functions that do things much more advanced than what I'm showing you here. OK, so that is kind of uh, the simple explanation of functions. Now, you can have a function that doesn't return something. And this is the next example that I will show you. So in this case, both of these functions returned an int. And since I said they were going to return an int, they must finish by returning an int. No matter what happens in this function, they must return an integer. If they do not return an integer, we will get an error. And I think I can actually probably show this to you. Uh, if I run this right now and I have int and there's no return statement in here, we're going to get an issue. It says warning, no return statement in function, returning non void. So that was a warning, not necessarily a uh, actually, I think that's an error yet because it was highlighting in red. But regardless, it's telling me, hey, you didn't return an int. That's a problem because you said you were going to return an int. So now if I return zero and I run this, all is good. We don't get that warning. So just keep that in mind. All right, I'm going to erase these. I'm going to show you now how we make a function that is defined as what's known as void. Now, a void function simply means it does not return a value. So I can say void and then I can say um, like test. And then here, what I can do in this function is whatever I want. And I do not need to return anything. So when I say void, let's just maybe go through a for loop here. Uh, we can say for int i equals zero, i less than 10, i plus plus. And then maybe what we do here is we see out uh, and we just see out i. And then we end l. So now I can call this function. If I call test, we can see, oh, I need a semicolon. Sorry, let's add the semicolon that we just run this function, right? We just print zero to nine. No problem. We don't need a return statement. What happens if we add a return statement? Let's return zero and see what we get. Notice that we get an error that says return statement with a value when this function was defined as void. So again, this is why it's very important, important, sorry, that you understand the types of your functions, what they return, what they're taking in as parameters and all of that. All right, so let's call test again. Let's call it another time, right? So this is another good example of why you would want to reuse a function. It's way better to have a function that say prints the numbers from one to 10 that I can use multiple times than to print the numbers to one to 10 like three times. So if I were to take this for loop and just copy and paste it three times like that works, it's going to do the same thing as we have right now. But now consider the uh, situation where we want to change the number of times that we're looping. So let's say we want to now loop 100 times instead of 10 times. Well, what I would have to do now is change this 10 in three places if I had copy and pasted this for loop three times. So if we did like this, right, I would then need to change the 10 in three places as opposed to when we use a function here. Now I only need to change it in one place. 
that's again, another good reason why you would use a function uh, because it keeps your code more organized. And if you ever need to change something, it's better to change it in one place than in multiple places. But anyways, if I run this, you're going to see that we get kind of the expected output. We go zero to nine, zero to nine, zero to nine. Great. So that's an example of a function. Now let's see uh, if we can do something even better with this function. Maybe void test will instead take print. Uh, maybe we'll call this print n times and we're going to take in an integer n and we're going to take in a string text. Now what I'm going to say is instead of i is less than 10, I'm going to say i is less than n and I'm going to see out the text n times. So now what happens is I can use this function called print n times. We're going to pass in the number five and we're going to pass in the uh, the string Tim. OK, now I will kind of copy this line and we'll use it again. So we'll say print seven and then we'll say is great. Just, you know, a true statement here. And there we go. OK, so now let's run this and you see that we get Tim, 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 Tim is great, is great, is great, so on and so forth. So what I've done now is I've made this function a bit more general. So now it takes in some number n. That's the number of times we'll print something. It takes in some string text and it will print this text n times. And notice I named my function in a way such that it describes what it does print n times, right? It's telling me exactly what it does. And now anywhere in my program, I can use this function. Now where it gets very interesting is when we create functions that are used inside of other functions. So let's say void print and let's make this just take in some string. We'll call it text. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say C out text and L and I'm going to replace this line in my for loop now with this function print and this print is just going to take text. Now notice how my code all of a sudden is a little bit easier to read than it was before. If you're someone who you know maybe doesn't know C++, now what you can do is you can kind of read these function names and this gives you a better idea of what's going on, right? If I come to this main function, I can see oh, I'm printing n times and then I'm passing five and I'm passing 10. Again, it might still be a little confusing, but now inside of this for loop, I can see, oh, I'm printing something, right? Because maybe you don't know what C out means, but you know what print means. And so this is just another great example of kind of how you can use functions to really separate all of the logic in your code and make it so much easier for someone who doesn't know the code that you're writing to understand what's going on. So if I run this now, again, it works the exact same way that it did before, but I've just split my logic up into different functions. Now, you don't want to go too crazy with this. You don't want like super short functions. Uh, you want to sometimes have functions that are maybe a bit larger, that are doing different things. But the general rule of thumb is that your function should do one thing and it should do one thing very well. Now, you can define what that one thing is. That one thing can be, you know, one large thing and it maybe can use other functions to help it do that. But just keep that in mind that you don't want your function to be doing a ton of different things. It should be doing one thing and one thing very well. And if you notice you have a really, really massive function, maybe you can split that up into some smaller sub functions so that your code's a little bit easier and cleaner to read. And this stuff that I'm showing you comes with years and years of practice, right? This isn't something you pick up immediately, but I just want to give you the rationale and reasoning behind using functions. So we will continue in one second, but I need to quickly thank the sponsor of this video and this series, which is Algo Expert. Algo Expert is the best platform to use when preparing for your software engineering coding interviews. They have mock interviews, a data structures crash course, and over 150 super high quality coding interview questions. Check them out from the link in the description and use the discount code TechWithTim for a discount on the platform. So now there's some more things that we can do with functions. Uh, functions can get pretty complicated and pretty advanced. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you what's known as default parameters. I'm then going to go over pass by reference versus pass by value. So I'm going to make a function. I'm going to say int. I'm going to say uh, math. I'm going to say do math. OK, this is going to take in one value. I'm going to say int x and then I'm going to take an int y. I'm going to take an int z. But I want this last value z to be optional. Now, what that means by optional is that I want it to be able to be passed in, but it doesn't have to be passed in. So if I want that to be the case, I can give a default value for this parameter. And what that will do is make this now an optional parameter that does not need to be passed to this function. So to actually to clarify this, let me do something else. I'm just going to return x plus y times z, and I'm going to do the x plus y and then multiply that by z. So what you're going to see now is that if I try to call this function and I don't give any of these parameters, we're going to have an issue. So if I say do math and I give three and four, so I give an argument for x, an argument for y, but I don't give an argument for z, 
you're going to see that we get an error. It says expected. Oh, sorry. That needs a semicolon. Uh, but no, note declared here. Uh, what's our problem now? Okay. Declared here int do math return. Okay. So I think, uh, oh, here it is. Too few arguments to function int. This is the uh, error I was looking for. So it's saying, hey, you don't have enough arguments. This function uh, takes three and you only pass two. So I can fix that now by adding another one here, right? And there you go. All is good. Everything is working. But that's kind of the point, right? Is that you need to pass in all of the parameters. But sometimes you have a parameter that you want them to be able to pass in, but they don't have to pass in. So in that situation, you make it optional by adding a default value for it. So now when I say int z is equal to one, this means if you do not give me z, I'm going to assume that it is one. And this is the default value for the parameter z. And so now if I run this, you see that this still works because we implemented that default value. And let's see out this just so we can see what this is giving us. Uh, we get the value seven, right? And the whole idea, I guess, behind what I was thinking when I did this was, okay, I want to add two numbers together and then I want the option to multiply them by some factor. And in this case, if you don't give a, a value, it's just going to keep it the same because it's multiplying it by one. Whereas if I do pass a value, maybe I pass two, obviously now it uses that value two because it's overriding the default and now it's giving me 14. So that is what is known as an optional parameter. And again, these are parameters. These are arguments. Your parameters can be different types. As you saw, you can have as many parameters as you want. You can have a combination of optional and required parameters. You can have no parameters. Just depends on the type of function that you're creating. And so there you go. And then, of course, the return type can be any type that you would like. You can make this return type something crazy, right? You can make this return type a pair. You can say pair uh, int int. And then what you could do is actually make a pair. So let, let's do this. Uh, let's say function make pair. There is actually a function called make underscore pair in C++. So I'm kind of making a pseudo version of this. And let's take in two values, int x, int y. And now what I can do is I can return pair int int of x, y. And now if I see out, let's go make pair two, three dot first, we should see that we get the value two, right? Because that's the first value in our pair. And if we were to do second, then we get second. So functions are very, very flexible. You can do a lot of stuff with them. And again, this comes with practice, but the data type does not need to be something simple. Like you can do a vector, you can do an array, you can do a pair, you can do really anything that you want so long as you define what it is and you actually return something like that. And of course, our function does not need to just be one line. I can do all kinds of different lines, right? I can say, you know, if X is greater than Y, then maybe I make a pair where I have, let's do this here, uh, X and then Y. But otherwise, then what I do is I return a pair that has y and then x. That's totally valid. And just to note here, I don't actually need this else statement. I can just do this because what happens is that if I hit this first return statement, I immediately exit my program. So if x is greater than y, I return this. And that means I'm done. I, I'm finished the program. I won't read this line. However, if x is not greater than y, I don't go in here so I don't return. So then I just return this. So this is a very common practice you'll see when your people are writing functions is that they'll kind of omit an else in a lot of situations because they know if you get into the if statement, the function will kind of terminate and be done as soon as you get to the return statement in the if statement. And so it's kind of unnecessary to write the else afterwards because, well, you just don't need to handle that logic essentially. So hopefully that kind of makes sense, but you can have multiple return statements. That's what I'm trying to show you here in the function and whatever one you hit first, well, you're just going to return that and then you're going to be done the function. OK, so now I'm going to talk about pass by value versus pass by reference. Now, to do this, uh, let's make a simple function. Let's call this. Um, hmm. Actually, it's not going to be int, it's going to be void. We're going to say void swap. We're going to take int x and int y. OK, what I'm going to do is just say x equals y and y equals x. OK, that's what this function is going to do. And then in the main function, I'll say int x equals 2, int y equals 4. And these don't have to match. Like, let's actually make this a, b. And then I can call swap a, b. I'm going to C out a and L. I'm going to C out b and L. And then actually before I do that, we're going to C out a and b. And then right before I swap, I'm going to say C out um, swapping. OK, so I just wrote a lot of code there, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm printing out a and b before I swap. I'm saying, OK, I'm going to swap it now. And then I'm printing out a and b. 
So if you're looking at this, right, you can see that I have variable A, I have variable B. When I call this swap function, I pass A. And what that means is that X becomes whatever the value of A is, which in this case is two. So you can kind of imagine that when I call swap, X is equal to two, and then Y is equal to whatever B is, which is four. So then what I do is I say X equals Y. And so what this is going to give me is uh, X becomes equal to four. And then I say Y is equal to X. Well, now X has changed, right? And X is equal to four. So when I say Y is equal to X, well, Y is going to be equal to four as well. And so obviously that's not exactly what we want. I need to kind of fix this. I'm going to make a variable called temp. I'm going to say uh, int temp equals, and then this will be uh, X. And then what I'm going to do is say Y is equal to temp. So the idea behind this is that I'm going to store the value of X in a temporary variable. I am then going to assign X to be equal to Y because now I've lost whatever X was equal to, right? If I don't have a temp variable and then I assign Y to be equal to temp because now that will be whatever the original value of X was. So that would mean Y will now change to be equal to two. Anyways, the whole point of me showing you this is that I'm swapping two variables, right? I'm, I'm swapping their values. So the question I have for you is, is it going to swap the value of A and B here? Yes, X and Y will actually swap here, but will it change the value of A and B here? Now, if you remember my pointers and references, you should know the answer to this, but let's run this and see. Uh, oops, we get a problem because I always forget the damn semicolon. OK, let's rerun this and notice we get two, four swapping two, four. So the swap did not change the value of A and B. Now, the reason why that happens is that when you pass something like an int data type, actually what's known as a primitive data type, I'm not really going to completely discuss that, but it's what's known as a primitive data type to a function. Oh, sorry, this said X equal to Y equal four. <laughs> let's remove that. That wouldn't have changed the output, by the way, but regardless, um, when you pass a primitive data type to a function as a argument, argument meaning like a B, like these are the arguments. What actually happens is X becomes equal to. So the parameter in this function, a copy of the argument. So kind of what happens here is when I call swap of a B, right? A is equal to uh, two and B is equal to four. When we actually get to swap, X will be assigned to a copy of A, so a copy of two. And Y will be assigned to a copy of B, so a copy of four. So what that means is that the two and the four that I'm swapping here are not the same as the two and the four that are defined here. The reason for that, again, is that it's making a copy. Just like I showed you previously with references, when you assign like int A equals B, it makes a copy of B. It's not actually equal to B. However, if you do want to actually be able to modify these values, what you have to do is pass the reference to these values, not uh, what do you call it, the actual value itself. And so what I would do here is I would say ampersand X and ampersand Y. And now what this is saying is, OK, I actually want the reference of X and the reference of Y. So give me a reference to an int and a reference to another int. So that way I can actually modify these ints. OK, sorry for the cut there. Something was going wrong with my recording software. Regardless, now if we do this swap, OK, so now if I call swap A and swap B, what's going to happen is it's going to get the reference of A and the reference of B. I actually don't need to change this function call here. I'll show you why in a second, but I don't need to change this at all. And now when I run this, notice that we get two, four and then four, two. We actually did change the value of A and B in this main function from this function here. And again, just to refresh you, if I remove this ampersand, so I remove the reference, what happens is I get two, four and two, four. And again, the reason for that is that when I add these ampersands, this is kind of equivalent of me writing int ampersand X is equal to and then a, which means make a reference of a or a reference to a not copy a's value into the, uh, the variable X. So hopefully that makes sense. But that is kind of what we just did. We passed the reference to values and now these values can be modified uh, like their original value inside of this function. So that's very common. You'll see a lot of functions where you pass references. And again, the only situation where you want to pass the references where you actually want to modify this value that was passed in. You don't just want to make a copy of it. So hopefully this example cleared up pass by reference. Now you also can pass pointers, right? Like I can take a pointer here. So if I say int asterisk X and int asterisk Y. Now though, what I need to do is I need to change this to be ampersand X and ampersand B or sorry, ampersand A and ampersand B. 
Uh, the reason for that now is that this is saying, I want a pointer. So if you want a pointer, you need to actually pass a pointer. So you need to pass ampersand. So if I run this now, we do end up getting a problem, uh, but it wasn't with our call. So I'll discuss why we have a problem. The reason we have a problem is that we've taken in two pointers and then we've tried to kind of reassign pointer values, but we haven't dereferenced them. So what I can do now is say int temp uh, is equal to asterisk X. And then I can say X is equal to, uh, I can actually say, sorry, asterisk X is equal to asterisk Y. And then I can say asterisk Y is equal to temp. And hopefully this should fix it. Uh, let's see now we can see that now we get the correct values because I've dereferenced all of these pointers and we did still perform the swap this time using pointers instead of using references. So you can kind of do it in any way that you like. Uh, references make a lot more sense in functions, but if you do want to pass a pointer, you can't do that. Uh, so I think I'm going to leave it here. There is a ton to go through in this. As soon as you get into the world of functions and then object oriented programming, there's just a lot more to learn, a lot more that you can do. And this may be the last video in the series, I will warn you, unless you guys have some specific stuff that you want to see. So if you have more videos in this series that you want to see, maybe you want some more examples of functions, maybe you want uh, some different data types or object oriented programming, which I wasn't planning on covering, then do let me know and I will definitely consider it. With that said, I hope you guys enjoyed this series. Please do leave your thoughts on it in the comments. If you do appreciate this, make sure to leave a like, of course, subscribe to the channel and I will see you in another YouTube video.